behind it. So you might want to relax. This is going to be a long story. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole driving force behind Stan Tall was the fact that um, the National Park Service commissioned me to, to be their artist in residency at the Sequoia National Park two years ago. And uh, they put me up in a cabin in the Sierra Nevada mountains for a month and said, wander around, have fun, write some songs if you want to, and do a few shows for us at the park. Wow. <laughs> like, what's the catch? Right? <laughs> yeah, no, you know, that's what I did. You know? the, the cabin didn't even have power in it. You know, it was up in the mountains. And I could walk out and be in the Sierra Nevada, just in the pristine trails, in just a matter of a few minutes. And then go down maybe a couple thousand feet, and I'd be in the sequoia groves, giant sequoia groves. Anyway, one day I was down in the sequoia groves, down, I mean 7,000 feet. Um, and I was wandering around, and, and I came upon this just beautiful sequoia tree, and it was named the Colonel Charles Young tree. I was... Like, oh, this is, who is this Colonel Charles Young fellow, you know, this is, you know, how, why did he deserve to have this tree, beautiful specimen of sequoia, named after him. So I did a little research, and, if, you know, and, and Colonel Charles Young was an incredibly interesting guy. He was the first African-American uh, Army uh, person to be commissioned colonel in the United States Army in the 1890s. Very rare thing. The Army was segregated then. And, and the black units were officered by white officers. So Colonel Young was the first, the first African American to be commissioned um, colonel. And he did have a great career, uh, but even then, you know, there's a lot of limits to what he could do, being the first one through the door. Uh, he would have been a, probably a three-star or four-star general had he, had he been white. But um, anyway, when, when he retired, he, he, go, he went on to be of service to the public. He, they made him superintendent of the Sequoia National Park in the early days of the park's formation. And, you know, his army training really came in handy. The time he served the Spanish-American War and the Indian Wars came in handy here because in this day and age, in that day and age, in the late 1890s and early, to, um, early 1900s, the logging companies ruled the West, the big logging companies. They ruled it absolutely. They had all the power, and they, that power extended into the halls of the American Congress. And they could do whatever they wanted to. Even though these were public lands, they would just go in there with these, these gangs, really, of thugs. And, uh, you know, with, with guns and stuff, and, and they protected the lumberjacks as they cut down these sequoia trees. Hauled them off and made a killing. The first thing Colonel Young wanted to do was to stop this. And you can imagine the sort of... You know, you can, you can imagine that picture, right? These guys were, these, these logger barons were used to going in there and getting exactly what they wanted from, the, from these western forests. And all of a sudden, there's, there's an African-American dude that didn't use those words, of course, you know, in, an, in a uniform with a big gun on the side of his pants. And um, although he was outmanned and outgunned and, um, you know, and the, the logger... Barons, they were they were so powerful. He stood his ground along with a few of his colleagues, and he stopped these people from taking any more of those sequoias down. An amazing story. They firebombed his cabin. They shot at him. They tried to beat him up, and they didn't. He didn't back down. And he was an old man by this point. He was. He just stuck right to it. Amazing fellow. So I'm sort of sitting there, you know, just grooving on the whole story. And, thinking, oh, wow, what, in my little world, who would compare to that, you know, it's like, you know, my rock and roll sort of, you know, all country world, who would compare, in my punk rock world, who would compare <laughs> to that, and sort of the first thing, a really clear thought just bounced right into my mind, and, and, and in really big, big words, I could hear Ramones. <laughs> 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 and right on the spot, the song came. <laughs> really, really fast. And uh, you know, luckily I had there were so many angles I could go with it, you know, um, because the Scorchers, our first tour beyond the Midwest and South in little bars and stuff, our first real tour in big venues was opening for the Ramones in Texas in 1982. And this was a, a landmark experience for us. You can imagine. I mean, we we were just we were so green. 
you know, our, our van wasn't working, Warner's amp didn't work, Jeff didn't have bass strings, we had no money to even get to Beaumont, Texas for the first date. But we took it, you know, $75 a show is what we got for that tour in Texas, a thousand miles from our home. We drove to Beaumont, Texas, I, I sort of told my landlord that I would pay him when I got back, I took that rent money and we got down to Beaumont. <laughs> got into their venue and all of a sudden, it really dawned on us, wow, this is a 2,000-seater, and we're opening for the Ramones, right? <laughs> we're opening for the Ramones <laughs> in a 2,000-seat theater. <laughs> My God, Warner's Amp doesn't even work, you know? We haven't had a decent meal in four days. And, you know, we heard all these, you know, those was the Ramones, they were these tough guys from Queens, you know? And they, you know, they ate other bands for lunch, you know, these were tough fellows, right? They were actually absolutely cool to us hillbillies from Tennessee. Dee Dee was the first guy that we met. He saw, wow, these guys really need help. He <laughs> <laughs> us into our, his dressing room and he gave us some chicken wings and some beer and some deli tray food. And we were just like, oh my god, this is like lobster, you know. <laughs> gave Jeff some bass strings. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, I wrote this song. This is a song getting quite a bit of attention, actually. Yeah. And I'm proud of it for a lot of reasons, but I think I'm most proud of the title. It's the only uh, place in the world that all the things written about the Ramones um, and in the annals of Christianity where the words God and Ramones are in the same sentence. <laughs> God bless the Ramones. <laughs> I got a call from this New York dude. He had heard of the National Scorchers, busting doors and lighting torches. This guy offered us a Texas tour, guaranteed to make us less obscure. It was opening for the Ramones, you see, the Texas state of misery. And though we had no master plan, no amps at work, or a running band, we said yes, and away we went. Fifty dollars past due rent. We drove to Beaumont, Texas first. All in drag. <laughs> Ten thousand shows, they got it through. 